That was great. Now, Pastor Vernon Peterson. I appreciate that singing, that's beautiful. In fact, all the singing, but uh, I, it would have been a sad day if, uh, and, and Sabbath's not supposed to be a sad day, if they would have come and gone and not sang for us. <laughs> but we really appreciate that uh, testimony to the Lord. You know, throughout the, the Bible, and, and uh, you know, from the very beginning to the very end, we see a God that is sovereign, uh, all-powerful, able to do uh, anything he needs. Uh, he doesn't need us, but we certainly need him. Ironically enough, God has, has his partnership. Whatever God wants to do in his endeavors, he always uses us in it. He uses his people uh, to accomplish his purposes. Uh, you know, he makes us his servants, workers. Uh, with him, we, uh, he gives us certain uh, responsibilities to rule and sometimes to reign over the earth. Uh, we're, we're appointed this as, as uh, uh, keepers, as parents, as uh, elders, as teachers, or whatever it is, God uses his people for those purposes. And there's just a lot of illustrations in, in you know, as, as we read in the, the historical ancient Words, the ancient words that we we sung about earlier, uh, how that, you know, God's going to flood the earth, but He has Noah build an ark. Physically build an ark. Uh, he's going to part the Red Sea, but He has Moses holding the staff up, and uh, uh, He's going to destroy Jericho, but He has the Israelites marching around Jericho. And, uh, and I don't think it's, uh, I think that the whole point is that, that he's, not, he's not wanting us to be proud and, sh and show that we're, we're helping God in that. It's just that in all of these things, il illustrations, whether it's, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, okay, he's the one who was secretly harvesting the wheat. The grain, huh? Gideon, Gideon. Uh, even with Gideon, you know, he showed the illustration how that he had to pare down the numbers to show that it only took three hundred that he, you know, prepared. Uh, but and and that's what that that's the way it is. When God uses us, He uses us for His purposes, but He always wants to, us to realize that. He's the one that does it. The, the victory is God's. Uh, but he gives us commission as, as uh, his disciples to go into all the nations, spread the, gods to the, to the gospel to the, to the very ends of the earth. And that commission has never been retracted. It's still with us today. And it's in effect until he comes back and we have a new commission. And it'll be a glorious one. Uh, but, but, you know, God always has this, this, I guess you could say, partnership. As we work, God works. Uh, he doesn't need us, but he includes us. And, and the, the church is, is a vehicle, an institution that God uses that, uh, to spread the gospel, to, to teach his word, and to warn the people of impending judgment that, that, you know, we're all, will come under, and the whole world will come under, you know, before he comes back. But, uh, you know, we often need the help of others, and, and God uses us as a, as a church to get a lot of those things done. Uh, and I think we should, we should be elated that God does 
offer us stability, but it, all, it is all for our good. And I, I, uh, I really feel that our unity as God's people is, uh, it, it's not emphasized enough. Uh, we often abbreviate words to maybe shorten them up or something like that. For instance, we, we use the word church as uh, we call this the church, but this is not the church, it's the church building. We're just abbreviating it. Uh, when we say we're going to church, we're, we're, just, uh, we're just going to a church meeting. But this word church is, uh, I kind of wish that a lot of these things that are translated were translated into the meaning that it is you find in the Greek or, or whatever language it was originally written in because that word ecclesia, the people, when they heard that word, it meant called out ones. And uh, that's literally what it is. It's an assembly of believers, a congregation of believers. Uh, it's, it's, it's a group. It's the called out ones of God. Therefore, we take the moniker Church of God. It's very fitting and appropriate. Uh, I know it's the trend to have some different name. A lot of churches have different names, but I'm satisfied with just the Church of God uh, because that's what it is. Uh, you know, it's, this is where we, we meet every Sabbath. I think that, uh, that this building is dedicated for a special purpose and, and we should not uh, misuse it. We should take care of it. Uh, that's part of our responsibility. But this building is not the church. We don't worship this church. We don't have idols that we, we look to and pray to and things like that. It just This is a building that's for utility, utility, utilitarian purposes, but it is for a set-aside purpose. Of course, the scriptural definition of the word to set aside for special purposes is sacred. So in that sense, it's sacred. Uh, <clears throat> but it is the church that goes into the community and, and witnesses and spreads the gospel. Uh, but as a church, we only spent, I think I figured it out, it's 1.7, at least for this congregation, less than 2% of our time here. So <clears throat> the church is always here where is the church the rest of the time? Uh, you know, we are all in our homes and our business, our, our, our at work, and we're out, we're working throughout the community. So the impact of the church shouldn't be just what happens here. Really, what happens here doesn't impact the, the church, the world too much. What happens out in the world as we traverse and are going to and fro. That's what impacts the world and the testimony that we have and, and, and the, the word that we spread to the world. There's only one church. And there's a, there's a verse that uh, is the list of ones. It's found in Ephesians 4 through 6. And uh, uh, it goes through, it starts with, with verse 4 here. It says, there is one body and there is one spirit, just as you were called in one hope, and, and your calling. All these ones are different from each other. And there is one Lord, <clears throat> one Lord. Of course, it's referring to Jesus. One Lord Jesus, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. So we notice that there's only one God and only one Lord Jesus. We also see that if there is one body, uh, and the scripture said there, there is only one body, the, uh, and this body is in the world. And uh, sometimes <clears throat> in verse 22 and 23, it says we find out that this, this body is, what, the, what this body is, it says, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, to the called out ones. This is talking about Jesus, uh, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. 
this is Christ's body. That's because Christ is the head. We are the body. Uh, we, we share the same flesh, uh, humanness. Uh, Jesus Christ, it says, is, is the, uh, he is the mediator between the man, he is the, man, the mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ that refers to him. Uh, he went through the same things we did, he suffered as we did, yet without sin. But <clears throat> this is, this is a, 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 a body that is identified as something that is, that is united. Uh, they have, there's obviously many things that we have in common. And there can only be one church. Now, before you get the wrong conclusion, uh, we need to put that in perspective. This one church, the same church that, the, it's, it's the same church that the, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he returns, that is coming, will, uh, will be drawn up to him. Uh, it'll include all the saints that have ever been, from Adam on, on to, to uh, the, the day that he, Christ returns. Uh, it's likely to be a lot of people, but a lot of people are not here meeting today. <clears throat> So when you refer to the church, it needs to be identified what, what we're talking about because sometimes context is, well, always context is, is, is the most, it's king, it's the most important thing when we speak of the scriptures. So I think we have to ask, well, what is the churches that Paul organized? Uh, every group is expedient that we meet as a group, as a church. We know that Paul went out and he, he set up elders. He, uh, over, uh, he, he set the church up to be organized and overseen as elders. And as in uh, Acts, he, it tells us in the 14th verses, so when they had appointed church elders in every church, uh, this is one of the things that Paul did. He went out, established churches, preached the gospel, brought people in, and appointed elders so that there was an organization, a structure to this church, to this group of people. Because, you know, if you're gonna to gather together, there has to be a group that's gonna to gather together and, and uh, it has to work in unison for its purposes. But uh, he appointed elders in every church and this is the way that, that the Lord has set up his church. Uh, notice in, uh, 11 and 12 how he, he uh, supplied those needs it says and he himself gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ well in these verses we see the components and function of the, of the church it's, it's by these verses that we see the purpose of, of you know the offices uh, as we continue on in 13 and 14, it says, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure and stature and fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. In essence, I mean, I think sometimes we, we read over these things too quickly. To, re to realize the mechanics of, of what, what is done in the church. All these things listed in these verses, we should find right here in this church. Uh, it, it, it gives us the whole purpose of it so that we can stand, so we can be edified, so that we can grow in Christ, uh, so that we're not carried away by every wind of doctrine we're edified by those things that are taught, those things that are brought out, brought out in the scriptures, uh, uh, you know, not being little children, just naive. But unless people come together and uh, uh, study the scriptures together, it's hard to be a loner uh, and, and be a Christian, especially if you're a new babe. I know when I first, uh, decided to become a Christian, I, 
I couldn't understand the words. It was so confusing to me. But it wasn't until I studied with people and, and, uh, and you know, listened to them and weighed them and, and uh, I'd heard enough of, of uh, you know, I was, I was raised in, a, in, a, in another church and I had already realized that there was a lot of things that they taught that were just not scriptural. But uh, the closer I got to people who were uh, knowledgeable what the scripture really said, the more I clung on to it. But uh, uh, so this is this goes into the whole purpose of of, of the church. Uh, the goal is to bring the saints that's that's us into spiritual maturity. And so that we resemble Christ. So to put on the mind of Christ uh, in character and, and uh, in, in all ways as, as uh, in, in godliness. <clears throat> but, you know, in the day, I'm, it's, it's, it's as bad and probably a lot worse, but there's all kinds of false doctrine and you know, it refers to as, as the, the winds blowing back and forth in these verses. Uh, you know, it, it's it's just people have, have mingled the word of God with man's philosophies and, and uh, religious imaginations, uh, and uh, you know, into into the assemblies of, of God's people, and, and it just caused a lot of confusion. And you know, if it wasn't for the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I think that uh, you know it, it be it would be impossible. But the church should be focusing on teaching the truth, uh, not in uh, entertaining or appeasing people for maybe what they want or what they don't want. Uh, if you're if if you're if you've if you've got the word of God in front of you, you've got to speak the word of God. It's got to be it's got to be got to be the truth. Uh, the, and sometimes it's uncomfortable. Uh, the word it talks about the word of God as being like a a, a sword that cuts and divides, and uh, uh, we are that's what the word the word of God does. It it it, it cuts us. It it, it divides uh, truth from fiction, uh, and you know it. Uh, sometimes it, it makes us feel a lot very uncomfortable, and it, a lot and it. Cre- causes us to have to make decisions at time. Am I going to follow God or am I going to, going to follow what I want? Uh, you know, uh, we, can, we can get caught up in our music and become very emotional, but without a foundation behind that, it's just entertainment. Uh, there's got to be something behind it. It's, uh, it, it's, it's certainly a joyous thing to, to be able to, to listen to music that is founded in God's word, that expresses our testimony and, uh, and what God has done for us. You know, if you really want to fully realize what, what Paul means by uh, this next verse, you have to read 2 Corinthians that, that tells them that... Uh, that it was love that really drove them to, when Paul condemned them in 1 Corinthians. It was really love that, that made Paul harsh to them to tell them some hard things. Uh, verse 15 of Ephesians uh, 4 says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ. For from the whole body it, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So by not mincing words and, and, and accepting the scriptures, the truth, giving it in love, it causes us to grow in Christ. And... Uh, and, and as a body, we grow together in, in unity. And, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an organic thing that there should be always new people coming in. 
uh, new people to whether it's children or or people coming in. We don't see that like we should, like we we wish we could. Uh, but uh, it's it's the way it works. Um, see, Paul, when he told told them that uh, you know in First Corinthians that. They were in error because of what they were allowing in their, their church. In, in his first epistle to the Corinthians, uh, you know, in the second epistle, he praised them for, for listening, and it actually had very positive results. Uh, and and uh, it caused the church to be a closely knit body. Uh, throughout a, the epistles were instructed how the church is to function, Ephesians, Philippians, all these church, these, uh, these uh, chapters are, are written for the church. There aren't a lot of, in fact, uh, as far as uh, uh, the people as Christians functioning by themselves, there's not a lot of that, just, uh, uh, just personal responsibility. There is a lot of that, but uh, but we see this, this, this church function as organized as elders and deacons and teachers and others to serve in, in different capacities. Uh, the elder women are to teach the younger, younger women. Uh, we're encouraged to exhort one another. We're, we're to love one another. Uh, you know, this is, this is what the church is. It's, it's, it's not a structure or a monument or something that we pay homage to. It's, it's not a dictatorship uh, that passes down edicts, you know, to, to the minions below. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gathering of God's people that work together uh, for, for the good of all. Uh, when, when the Bible speaks of the church, it's either talking about God's people in general or it's talking about such as those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life or it's talking about congregations, groups of people meeting to, together uh, in various locations, and that's the extent of it. I don't find uh, the superstructure of organized worldwide. Uh, that, that's not in the scriptures. Uh, unfortunately, that's what we see today. And uh, uh, I'll get into this a little more on, on what we do with that. but. Nowhere in the scriptures do we find a place for individuals that float from congregation to congregation. I know that happens a lot. Uh, maybe, and much more today than it did 20, 30 years ago or 50 years ago or whatever, uh, because the message very often is all the same. I think it's because of mass media. Uh, everybody's reading the same books and those kinds of things. Uh, people just kind of go back and forth and uh, there, there's not a lot of uh, commitment to, uh, to a, quote, church, a group of people that, that meet in, in unity. Uh, you know, going alone is never, never taught, but rather warned against in, in the scriptures. Uh, it really, it goes against the very nature of what God wants us, us to be. There is a purpose in having to work together side by side by, with people. Because, you know, it does say iron sharpens iron, but it also causes friction sometimes. And sometimes you have to work through that. Uh, the church, you know, as a, as a body should be working together and functions together for a purpose. But, you know, in every church there's certain characteristics of the members that, that really enables us to survive as, as, as a group. Uh, people see a need and they, and they fill it, they feel uh, they're through different gifts and whatever. But, uh, you know, without these different folks taking different responsibilities, uh, you know, the church would just wither away. You can't have just one, it, it's not a one-man show if, if people are following one person. Uh, that's, that's idolatry. Uh, Everybody should know their purpose, and they, you know, they should be all committed to sharing the gospel with the lost. But they're, but they're committed to do what they can do in, in the body and and, uh, and furthering the word of God and, and the, the ministry of, of, of the church. Uh, 
you know, we all should know that if, if there's somebody we don't like, there's something wrong there within the body. We love one another. Uh, you know, and, and not only that, but we don't compromise what we know is right, truth. Uh, and I think probably one of the most important ingredients is we know how to forgive. Um, it happens that sometimes we offend each other, but we should know that that uh, what the scriptures teaches on that, that you got to forgive. Uh, you can't come to God without forgiveness. The 32nd verse of Ephesians 4 says, Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. So there, there really are a lot of benefits of a committed church uh, that's, they, they share together and in, in participate together. Uh, our children are, are much more li likely to serve God when they become older. If your attitude towards church is sporadic, you know, your, church are gonna, your children are gonna see that, you know, it's not really important. And, you know, when they get older, they won't be there. Uh, they will do whatever your priorities are. Our marriages are much more likely to be solid if, if we're committed to, to uh, a church and uh, we're gonna get along better with our neighbors because we're implementing God's, God's word and we're teaching each other how, how we, how we that's, you know, the whole scripture is about relationships and how we deal with relationships uh, whether it's our neighbors or our enemies or, you know, our, our, our spouses or whatever it is. And uh, another big benefit is we have people that care for us through thick and thin, no matter what. There's, a, there's, a, there's people that, uh, that have a compassion for us and not just looking out for themselves. And I think we all need to ask ourselves, well, where do we find our place here? You know, are we really part of a, 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 this, an organization that God has blessed, just a, you know, institution, marriage, and the family is an institution, the church is an institution of God. Uh, it, it's something that is, uh, that is uh, uh, designed by God. Acts 2.41 says, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. You know, this is the beginning of the early church. And they all came in, became part of a fellowship. They become fellow Christians. Uh, they, they, they cared for one another. They shared food, possessions. They prayed for one another. Uh, times were pretty hard then. There was a lot of persecution going on. Uh, but they, they saw themselves as spiritual brothers and sisters. That's where that, those names come from, brothers and sisters, as they're part of a family. And, you know, when we become, when we become part of a, a church, we become something really very important. Uh, we enter a fellowship with not just the brethren, but God's people wherever they are. In a sense, we, we enter fellowship with the apostles and all of God's people through, through time. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, you know, we need to find ourselves not just someone who just goes to this certain building once a week, but uh, in fellowship with, with those who are called out. Uh, because, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a deal where you're e either in or you're out. Uh, I would like to cover a few verses here finally on, uh, you know, throughout the scripture, you, need, you see, the, see the words, and, and uh, especially in the New Testament, it says, my people. Well, he uses it in the Old Testament too, but uh, I, I wanna read some verses in, in the New Testament here where it talks about this term, my people, and it's used numerous times. In Matthew 2, 6, it says, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are not the least among the rulers of Judah, 
For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. But we know what, that was a prophecy concerning Jesus being born in Bethlehem. And out of him would be a ruler over my people. Well, this isn't talking about Old Testament Israel at this time. It's talking about my people when Jesus came and my people right now. Uh, Acts 7.34 says, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. And I have heard the groanings and have come down to deliver them and now come and I will send you, I, I will send you to Egypt. Talking to, he's talking to Moses here. But he hears the groanings of my people. God is always concerned about my people because not everybody is his people. It's his will that they are, but they, they aren't. Uh, Paul also quotes Hosea in, in nine, Romans 9.25. He says, I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who was not my beloved. It was not beloved. This is, if you're familiar with the scriptures, this is talking about those Gentile people, non-Jewish non heritage, the Gentile people who were grafted in. You know, the early church was predominantly Jewish people. Paul went out and, and uh, spread the gospel throughout all the world and we're still spreading that gospel. But uh, he says, I will call them my people. That's us. That's, uh, that's where we find us. We are my people, says the, the Ecclesia. Uh, the last my people here is found in Revelation 18.4. Uh, now, if you've got any understanding of the symbols in, in this book, it, you, know, you should know that the word she refers to a church, or in, in, in this case, it's a false church, uh, false religion, as uh, the category called Mystery Babylon is, uh, is used in Revelation, and it refers to this false church. Uh, and, you know, there's a, it's, it's something that has mixed truth with uh, true teachings with false. And that's where people find themselves very often in this world. And Re Revelation 18, four, it says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Her is this false religion. Uh, lest you share in her sins, unless you receive her plagues. Uh, my people are, are asked to come out of her and so, or, or they're going to suffer the same end, same consequences. Uh, you know, this is something that, that uh, it concerns me greatly. And it's, you, you know, we don't always know how to deal with it or identify it. But I, I, I keep it real simple. If God reveals truth to me, and I think he reveals truth to all people, I have to accept that, and that's what I work with. I can't go to go fellowship with, with some place where I am always in conflict with what truth is. I have to find those who I have a shared beliefs in, and that's why I'm here. That's why I come to this church, because I can have unity in the believers, and I'm not saying that we believe line up on every little thing. I, I don't think that's, that's what, uh, you know, God knows that there's going to be differences of, of how we see things sometimes, but, you know, in all the big things, all the important things, it needs to be, uh, I, I, there needs to be able to be a good fellowship. Uh, people who are committed to uh, not compromising the truth or just sat, being satisfied with you know, well, that's just the way it is, you know, and, and uh, but, you know, as we get closer to, to the last days, which, you know, his return is closer than it's ever been. You think about that, really it has, but look at what's going on in the world today. We see things happening and changing that definition of what marriage is, husbands and wives are just astounding the things that are, are happening so fast. Everybody's 
in chaos and mad at each other and hate each other. And, um, but I think that Hebrews 10.25 is good advice. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as, in the, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Keep the faith.